inside Hunter Park with the Chamber was hosted at the Bournes facility today. Uh, and I was super lucky to meet Gordon Bournes. And then Mr. Bournes mentioned in his presentation that the original garage uh, that his mother and father started the business in, they had a replica of it on the facility. Uh, and then I was even more lucky that he had time to take us through and give us a little bit of a tour. Uh, it's just amazing to, to think about, you know, this couple, obviously super smart people, um, but they came together and they worked together and they worked hard and they grew and they grew from the garage, which I'm gonna share the, I'm gonna attach the video to the end of this, the tour. Um, and now it's over an $850 million a year business. So if you have an idea, you put in the work, you do your homework, you, you know, just be smart about it and it could be something huge. So it was really inspiring to see and to hear the story. Yeah, it's, it's become really our uh, uh, archive um, museum for one of the original equipment. Uh, my, uh, my dad uh, built this drafting team. So my mother was the administrative person. She uh, had a degree in education, but during the summer, she worked for a family jewelry store in downtown Milford, Michigan. Both my parents grew up in Milford. And uh, so she kept the books and did all the inventory control and managed the store while the owners were gone for a summer vacation. So wow. she learned a, a lot about bookkeeping and administration. And my, my dad um, uh, knew a lot about the um, technology from his uh, degree in physics from the University of Michigan. But um, this is um, one of his um, <clears throat> drawings that he did. In fact, it's dated, um, I think it's, um, May, 5th, May 18th, 1948, and uh, that's his initials on it, and one of the early products that they made. And um, so he designed the products, and my mother did all of the bookkeeping and administrative work, and typed up the data sheets and price lists and invoices on the manual typewriter. <laughs> but, wow, um, this is awesome. The, uh, the original products, the, the first one was a vein potentiometer, and these are still used today on uh, aircraft, but it, um, this would be on the um, outside of the aircraft. This is the aircraft skin. <clears throat> this would be on the inside. And it, so it tells the pilot whether the aircraft is, is flying kind of with the nose up or the nose down, and it, it helps the safety and efficiency of the aircraft. Does it work for, hor do they have the similar thing for horizontal or just vertical? Uh, I think it's just vertical, um, but they may have something for horizontal too. I know the helicopters tape a string to the front. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Um, and then you can read out what the position is with these three terminals here. Wow. It, uh, so it's a potentiometer. <clears throat> and um, then this was a linear one that uh, would be used on the rudder or the elevators. It would uh, tell what the. Uh, is that that drawing? It's similar, similar to that. Mm -hmm. I think that's a dual one, yeah, so, huh? Oh, correct. And, um, and then pressure, and so this is the inside workings of a pressure potentiometer. Um, and as this element would expand or contract, just like a um, water bottle, when you go up to the mountains here, the water bottle um, expands. Oh. So this would expand or contract, and then it moves a little wiper along this element here, and and so you can tell what the uh, oh, I see it. the pressure is. Yeah. So that's that's the resistance. And that's just right based there. on this is expanding or contracting. It, exactly. Oh, wow. So that, that would move this uh, along the, the, the wiper there. Oh, I see it. You can see it moving there. Oh. And uh, so it would change the resistance, and, and then you could read it out on these three terminals. And same kind of idea. <clears throat> this is an accelerometer, and it would tell what the acceleration is. So it's got a mass and a spring in it and a resistive element. And again, you can use the three terminals to determine what the acceleration is. Wow. Then they um, ultimately had to move to, to a bigger place. Um, it was a former candy store that was in downtown Pasadena. And they were there for about a year. And then <clears throat> the Chamber of Commerce moved them to, to Riverside. That's great. But this is one of the parts that was used on the space shuttle. And similar to the some of the parts that the astronauts used when they walked on the moon. It yeah. was controlling the... Uh, air that they were breathing, uh, oxygen as they walked on the He's one of my parents to test the parts and make sure that they were work, would work in hot environments and cold. So this is where they, they tested the parts for the, <laughs> the hot environment in the oven and then they used the freezer for the cold environment. And then my dad built a lot of this test equipment to do the electrical testing of the parts. <clears throat> the oscilloscope and different meters here, and a strobe light, they had a silicon 
a centrifuge that they would spin the parts around and it would simulate high acceleration. And then they could use the strobe light to kind of stop action and they'd look at it and see how the part was performing while it was wow. uh, highly accelerated. Wow. But then going way back in time, <clears throat> my father was an only child on a, a farm in Michigan and uh, when he was very young he would build things like this little boat at the top. Um, this was a spool of thread and a pencil and he sharpened it with a whittling knife and so the tip of it is graphite so you can spin it and it spins a long time. Since it's so he's always creating. And he built this make little your own toys. battery powered submarine that would go along on the surface and then go dive underwater. How old was he when he made that? Do you know? <clears throat> he was probably like 12 or so. 12? That's yeah. I mean, <laughs> Wow. Yeah. Wow. And built these automobiles. And uh, this one is gasoline powered. This is electric powered, which he built back in the 20s. That's it was in oh. Sears and Robot Drill Press. Ah. Down to their local Sears in Pasadena. And Put it in the back of the car and brought the drill press home. When I was their first piece of equipment. <clears throat> the second is this um, South Bend um, lathe that they used to make a lot of their turned parts. I was looking at how they set oh, precision yeah, lathing yeah. for setting things. My dad would be just enamored in here. <laughs> um, what is this? What is this for people to about? Um, yeah, I, I'm not exactly sure. It's it's got a bunch of my dad's notes. Oh, it's just his notes in it. It's yeah, so this is 1937. Okay. Yeah, I think a lot of this is from his college um, days. Mm -hmm. It's got various um, drawings in it and ideas for for products. I think, but um, it's not done. <laughs> <laughs> no, they they did a lot of things by hand, and in fact, in the early days. Every part that they made, they did a chart that showed how it performed <clears throat> in terms of the resistance and the pressure. But they found that <clears throat> customers would start to say, well, that dot right there, we measured it, and it was right there instead. And <clears throat> so they decided to just say it's plus or minus like 1% and instead of doing a, a chart for every part. <clears throat> I guess one fin final thing from a construction standpoint, the original garage had a wall right here, and this part was a dirt floor, it was the chicken coop. Oh, wow. And so to expand, they, um, to, to add like 40% um, more space, they broke out this um, wall here, and they put concrete in it, and um, <clears throat> that line is exactly, the gentleman who built this garage replica got down on his hands and knees with tracing paper to get that crack exactly right. Oh, really?